How is everybody? Ooh, I'm feeling the energy. I uh, hope you have stayed cool uh, this past week and that you have air conditioning in your house that works. And uh, if for some reason your air conditioning breaks, you are not welcome at my house. So there you go, man. Um, Every week we uh, welcome the people who join us in different locations. And so regardless of where you're joining us today, I know we have a lot of people who join us online. You listen to us, you, you, you uh, uh, engage with us, you watch the videos. We welcome you. We welcome our Racine campus, and we welcome all of you at our Kenosha campus. And I changed my mind. If your air conditioning breaks, you are more than welcome uh, to call me, and I will connect you with someone who has air conditioning. All right. Uh, so I want to start today because we are celebrating dads by saying happy Father's Day to all of the baby daddies. <laughs> happy Father's Day, no? No? This past week, I had a uh, party after my house, and after everybody left, I realized somebody had stolen my antidepressants. I, I hope they're happy now. <laughs> Dad jokes, come on, are we not? This is what we do on Father's Day, right? Actually, one of the friends at the uh, party is cool because he had been battling an addiction to the hokey pokey for several years, but now he has turned his self around. It is, oh, oh, no. Because every year, every year, this is how we start Father's Day, right? But by the way, just one more here. Uh, I, I, I want you to know that I'm sorry and I apologize mean the same thing, except when you're at a funeral. <laughs> Let that just sink in for a little bit, right? All right, dad jokes are dumb. We, we won't do any more. Um, but but here's, here's the deal. If you are a uh, dad or you're celebrating a dad, I really do hope that uh, you have a fun and meaningful uh, time with them. Uh, I realize that's not going to be the case for everybody. Some of you, your, your dad has passed away. Uh, others of you, you have a strained relationship with your father. Uh, if you are a father, some of you, you have a strained relationship with one of your children. And so our ongoing prayer at Great Lakes Church for our dads is that as we follow Jesus and as we mature in our faith, that we would find inner healing. And that in a very personal way, we would experience God as our heavenly father. 3,000 years ago, King David of Israel describes God as a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. So if you grew up in an environment where your dad wasn't around, they were absent, or they were disengaged, or they were uninterested in you, or maybe you never heard them say, I love you, I'm proud of you. I want you to know God is a God, uh, is, is a father to the fatherless. In another one of his writings, King David says this. He says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate. Over and over and over throughout the scriptures, it's pretty fascinating that God is referred to as a father. Now, uh, obviously he doesn't have gender, but this is, this is how he's described so we can understand him. And so our hope is that we would experience God in a very real way as a father, and then we would reflect him in our parenting. And so let's just pause here and let us pray for our dads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you that you are a father who is tender and compassionate. You're not a God who's harsh with us. We thank you that you are a generous father, not a father who is stingy. We thank you that you are a father full of mercy and grace rather than vengeance, a father who protects and guides and loves. And today we pray for all of the dads. We pray that you would help us to reflect you in our parenting. We pray that you would give us wisdom and strength and discernment and patience to help us be good dads and to model for our children the kind of father you are to us. And for those who have a broken relationship with their father, for those who have a broken relationship with one of their children, we speak hope and healing and restoration in Jesus' name, amen. Now, a few weeks ago, we launched a summer teaching series called Just Jesus, right? And all summer long, we are doing our best to just put the spotlight on Jesus. And our hope is that we discover more and more of who Jesus is. So we're talking about him. We're looking at the character of Jesus. And uh, in just a little bit, we're going to do that, right? We're going to focus in on Jesus. But before we do that, what I want to do is kind of lay the foundation for where we are going. And since we're celebrating fathers today, um, I think you'd agree that when most of us think of fathers, or at least uh, men in general, there are going to be certain stereotypes that come to our mind, right? We have this picture in our mind that men are tough, that they're fearless and aggressive, that they love cars and sports, that they're super competitive. Uh, we have this stereotype that uh, men love the art outdoors, right? Grilling and mowing and fishing and hunting and golfing. 
They drink whiskey. They smoke cigars. They like shooting things. Uh, they enjoy growing beards, right? We have all types of stereotypes, but the thing about stereotypes is nobody ever fits it perfectly, right? There's no guy who's going to be able to check off the entire list. And if I'm honest with you, uh, if I were to take all the list of uh, things that uh, define a man, and, and there were 100 things on that list, I'd probably only be able to check off about 98 of them, all right? No, no of course not, man. I'd probably be 40 or 50%. Uh, for example, I have been trying now to grow a beard for about six months. This is, this is the success I've been having, right? Um, I'm not big on yard work. Some guys are, got a neighbor who's always out in your, I can't stand yard work. Um, I don't uh, obsess over sports. I enjoy watching sports. I just don't obsess over them. But one of the checkboxes that I can absolutely check off that fits the stereotype is I love, love, love deer hunting. More than almost anything in the world, I love deer hunting. I get up in a tree, it clears my mind. I do bow hunting. Uh, more specifically, I do crossbow hunting. But I get up there and I feel like I'm one with nature. And, and the thing is, I can hunt in all kinds of weather because now uh, I've been doing it for several years. I have all types of gear, right? Uh, this is my son and I a couple years ago, but you can see it can be zero degrees. It can be uh, negative 10 outside. And I actually do fairly well. I am not bothered by temperature, rain, mosquitoes. And, and so I enjoy hunting with just a couple of exceptions. I hate walking to the deer stand when it is completely dark. Okay? I just hate it. Several years ago, I uh, was hunting in the evening, waited for the sun to go down. The sun went down. I put a light on top of my head, got out of the tree, and I started walking. And as I'm walking about 25 or 30 yards in front of me, this is what I see. Eyes. And I just freeze. And I start to kind of try to figure out what animal is this? And based on the height, I just assumed this must be a deer. I was hoping it was a deer. I was hoping it wasn't a bear. In fact, the guy whose property I hunt on, he told me uh, just a couple years ago, I said, hey, just so you know, we had bear on our, uh, our trail cam. I said, don't, don't tell me that ever. Please just keep that out, you know, but keep that to yourself. But I, I see these eyes, and so I just, go, go, get out of here, go, go. And eventually uh, it runs off. Again, I'm assuming it's a deer. Um, but then I just keep walking, and I'm almost out of the woods, and all hell breaks loose. In this tree above me, I just hear this crazy commotion. I scream. And uh, didn't know until later that what it was is turkeys, all right? Because apparently turkeys roast in trees at night to avoid predators. I kid you not, all the way back to the cabin, I am quoting out loud the 23rd Psalm. I am saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, right? I get, yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with I mean, this is literally my experience. And then I get back to the cabin, and I share it, and they're making fun of me. But uh, the, the guys acknowledge, like, you know what? We don't enjoy walking in complete darkness either. And uh, as I've shared that story with hunters over the years, uh, most of them have just opened up and said, you know, Dave, uh, you, you, I know you feel like insecure sharing this with us, but, you know, nobody likes really walking in darkness where you can't see anything. And, and that's just a reality of life, right? Because when there's darkness, it's unknown. When we can't see what's around us, what happens is our imagination starts going wild and we start imagining all types of scary animals and monsters and serial killers and Detroit Lion fans and we're just like, we're trying to get through this, right? But what's interesting is that in the different manuscripts that make up our Bible, darkness is a metaphor for things that aren't that good. It's a metaphor for evil, it's a metaphor for despair, for confusion, in fact, King Solomon of Israel, here's what he writes. He says, the way of the wicked is like total darkness. When we look at many of the things unfolding in our world, whether it's the division, the, the hatred, the anger, the abuse, the wars that are happening, often we're at a loss for words. How, how do you describe the evil that we see? And sometimes the only adequate word that we seem to find is the word darkness. And it's not just a metaphor that's used in the Bible, right? It's a metaphor that's used in all aspects of culture and art and literature. So when Darth Vader says, you underestimate the power of the dark side, we know he's not talking about rainbows and unicorns and lollipops. Or he's not talking about good things. When someone talks about being in a dark season, we know that they're referring to a sense of hopelessness or despair they're going through. 
When somebody talks about being trapped into the darkness, we know that they're referring to depression or the inability to think clearly. When someone says, hey, I have a dark secret that I need to talk about, we know this is something that hasn't been shared because of the embarrassment and the shame surrounding it, something that could possibly incriminate them. And so darkness is something that's referenced in the scripture. It's something that is seen in different aspects of culture. It's evidence in all types of the world. But darkness is also something that every one of us experience on the inside. Every time that we're tempted to bring pain to another person through our words or actions, that's darkness. Every time we elevate ourselves at the expense of another person, that's darkness. Every time that we fuel our lust by objecting another person in a sexual way, that's darkness. Every time that we lie to someone and we withhold the truth, that's darkness. And this world is filled with darkness. It always has been. 2,700 years ago, the Jewish people were in a very dark season as a nation. What had happened is the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered by the Assyrian Empire. They were an empire just to the north. They'd come down, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd conquered Israel. And so uh, the southern kingdom of Israel, which was known as Judah, they were pretty much a vassal state, which means that they had to pay tribute and uh, they had to remain loyal to the Assyrian Empire in order to have a little bit of independence. But it was a very, very dark time in Israel's history. And it's during this time in their history that the Jewish prophet Isaiah warns the Jewish people. He says, things are bad and they're only going to get worse. He says, things are dark and they're just going to get darker. But then he offers these words of hope. Here's what he says. He says, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Isaiah says, it's bad, things are going to get worse, it's dark, but it's going to get a whole lot darker. I want you to know that's not going to go on forever. And sure enough, his words came true. Things got worse. Israel lost their place of prominence in the world. For hundreds and hundreds of years, we read of no evidence of God's activity. It's like God is completely silent. And then 700 years after Isaiah writes these words, Jesus is born. Now, when he wrote these and he spoke these, nobody had a clue that it was a reference to Jesus' birth. But sure enough, he's born into the world. It's God taking on human flesh, revealing to the world who he is and what he's like. There's a lot of confusion about who Jesus was and what his purpose was. But throughout his life, people slowly began to connect the dots. And one of those individuals who started to connect the dots was a guy by the name of John. John was a disciple of Jesus. He had spent roughly three years learning from Jesus, hanging out with him, having conversations with him, listening to him, watching him interact with people, seeing miracles. And when John was an old man, somewhere around 80 or 90 years old, he feels compelled to write about Jesus. He wants for future generations to know about Jesus. He wants to give them an eyewitness perspective. Now, John may have not actually written with his own hand. It's very possible he dictated to a scribe. But he he says, I I, want to get these words out of me. Now, to give you a little bit of context about John, he didn't have an easy life. In his eight or nine decades on this planet, John saw and experienced many, many, many dark moments and dark seasons. No matter what story, what, what your story is like, no matter how dark of a season you've been through, and this is not to minimize it, but You can't imagine what John went through. John lived through the deaths of many of his family and friends, including Peter and John, who had been executed by Nero because of their faith. John was alive in 70 AD when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, took control of the city, and sieged it. Big moment in Jewish history. When they laid hold of it for a period of seven months, uh, just tragedy started happening within the the city of Jerusalem. Many of the Jews started dying because of starvation and plagues. The Jewish historian Josephus, he says that uh, more than a million Jews were slaughtered and over 100,000 of them forced, 100,000 Jews were forced into the Roman slave markets. Very dark time. It was during the siege of Jerusalem that the Jewish temple had been destroyed. Here's a model of what the temple, this is a place of worship. This is how they connected with God. If you were to visit Jerusalem today, you can actually see uh, some of the remains of uh, 
of, of what had been destroyed. And, and so John has seen in his lifetime all types of bloodshed and loss and chaos that we cannot even imagine, and he never loses his faith. And here he is, he's at the end of his life, and he, he's pausing and he's looking back at what he has seen, what he has experienced, but he's also thinking back about the impact of Jesus and how Jesus impacted him personally, how Jesus impacted uh, the, the people uh, of, of, of Israel. He's thinking about Jesus' impact on culture. And he's trying to put into words everything he's feeling. He's just trying to summarize what, what he's experiencing. And he's like, when, when I think about Jesus, the best way I know to put it is like this. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. John says, as I look back, I realize more than ever that, that Jesus is like light. And he's not just light for a select group of people. Jesus is light for all of humanity. To those who are experiencing the darkness of pain, Jesus is a light that brings healing. To those experiencing the darkness of anxiety and restlessness, Jesus is a light that brings peace. To those experiencing the darkness of rejection, Jesus is a light that brings acceptance. To those experiencing the darkness of guilt and shame, they're feeling the impact of maybe some of the decisions that they've made or people have done to them, Jesus is the light that brings healing or forgiveness. John says, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then he continues. He says, that light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never is extinguish it. John says, hey, listen, Jesus was crucified 50 or 60 years ago. And in spite of everything that's been done to try to eradicate his impact, in spite of everything that's been done to try to put out the light of Jesus and the impact he's made, nothing has been able to snuff it out. Military leaders haven't been able to do it. Roman empires haven't been able, or emperors haven't been able to do it. The destruction of the temple hasn't been able to do it. Even the death of Jesus did not put out the impact of Jesus. It actually fueled it. And John says, here I am. I'm an old man. I've seen a lot. I've experienced a lot. And I'm absolutely convinced that no matter what happens in this life, no matter how deep the heartache, no matter how extreme the fear, no matter how dark the depression, that there is a light that shines in darkness and there is no amount of darkness and there is no type of darkness that can put it out. We need to pause every so often and remind ourselves of this. Because one of the ongoing realities of life that all of us experience is it really doesn't matter how nice we are, how mature we are, how much we love Jesus, we will have dark days. We will have dark seasons. King Solomon of Israel, he talks about this in one of his writings. He says, when people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But let them also remember there will be many dark days. There will be dark days emotionally where we feel defeated and discouraged. There's going to be dark days mentally where it's hard for us to think clearly and hard to make decisions. We don't know which way to turn. We're second-guessing ourselves. There's going to be dark days relationally where we have conflict and tension with other people. There's going to be all kinds of dark days, days of loneliness, days of grief, anxiety, fear, heartbreak, depression, despair. But John says to his readers, he says, I want you to know that when you see darkness all around you or when you experience it inside of you, when you feel it in a powerful way, Jesus is a light that shines in the darkness. And no matter how dark it is, the light cannot be ex extinguished. Now, that, that's a pretty big statement, right? That's like you picking your favorite team and say, they're gonna win every game, right? The light can never be extinguished. But what's fascinating is Jesus said something very similar about himself. One day he is teaching at the temple. We saw a picture of that earlier, what the temple looked like. He finds himself surrounded by a Jewish audience. Some of them are religious leaders. And Jesus looks to them, and here's what he says to them. He says, I am the light of the world. He didn't say religion is the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I'm the light of the world. Why is that such a big deal? Because we live in a world that is totally and completely and utterly dark. Most of the time, we don't even have a clue how dark our world is because our eyes have become adjusted to the darkness. We become adjusted to the 
individualism and materialism and consumerism. We've become adjusted to the abuses of power and the injustices. It's like if you've been to a movie theater and you sit in that theater for a couple hours and it's dark and it's the middle of the day and then you leave the theater, right? And you go outside. It's like, man, you thought you died and went to heaven. It's like waiting for the hallelujah chorus. It's so bright. And it takes a while to, to readjust. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Now, there's all types uh, of implications that this phrase has, and I wish we had time to get into them all, right? Think of all the things that light does. Light causes things to grow. So if you plant something, it needs light, right? Light creates a sense of safety and security. Light tends to make us happier and reduces symptoms of uh, depression. Light has the ability to clean and sanitize. That's what UV light does. Right? Light can be used for healing. It can focus our attention. All types of implications and uses for, life, for light. But the primary way that we use light, of course, the way we're most accustomed is to what? It's to illuminate things. It's to see things. So you walk into a dark room, you turn on the light. It helps us see things we wouldn't normally be able to see. The reason that surgeons use bright lights when they're operating on someone is because they want to see every detail. I'm going to tell you, you should be very concerned if right before the surgery, the doctor looks at you and says, hey, I just, I'm just kind of feeling like I want to be relaxed here, so I'm going to put on some mood lighting. Right? I'm going to turn it down. You don't want that. You want them to see every detail. Light illuminates. The reason we have headlights on our cars is to see the path in front of us. When we're going through dark days and we're stumbling around or can't see clearly, we desperately need good light. And I'm guessing all of us have experienced this that the different things we look to to light our way aren't always the best light. Media is not always a great light. In fact, it's rarely a great light. Our gut instincts are rarely a great light. Self-help books, man, they're nice, they're helpful, I read them. They're not always a great light. We need something brighter, and so Jesus offers himself. He says, I am the light of the world. When you know me, when you discover me, when you learn about me, you begin to see more clearly. The reason we're doing this teaching series, Just Jesus, is because we want to grow in awareness of who Jesus is. We want for the light of Jesus to become brighter in our life. And the brighter it becomes, the more we start to see what's on in the inside of us that we didn't even realize was there. Right? So in one of his letters, the Apostle Paul, he explains that whatever is on the inside of us exposes, is exposed when light shines on it. He says, hey, there's greed, there's lust, there's anger, there's jealousy. When, when the light gets on it, you're, you're going to see it. And then he says this. He explains why. He says, for the light makes everything visible. The more clearly that I see the grace of God evidenced in Jesus, the more aware I become of how harsh I really am. I didn't think I was, it was that big of a deal. But the more clearly I see Jesus, the more I see what's inside of me. The more clearly I see the love of God in Jesus, the more I'm able to see the bitterness and anger inside my heart the more clearly I see the generosity of God in Jesus, the more I'm able to identify the greed and selfishness inside of me. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Let me just ask you, what is Jesus trying to illuminate in your heart? What is Jesus trying to show you or reveal to you that you don't want to see? Do not run from the light. Jesus isn't trying to shame you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to change you. All of us have things inside of us that need attention. Let me close with this story. We have a lot of guys at this church who love watching MMA or UFC fights or boxing or kickboxing and um, basically anything where someone gets hurt, right? That's, that's like, oh, I get calls all the time. Hey, you want to come see this fight? You want to see this fight? And I'm like, they, they must look at me and think, Dave's a fighter, right? Uh, but here's the deal. Um, lots of guys are into this, and some of you are going to remember, uh, but years ago, there was a fighter by the name of Jens Pulver. He was known as Little Evil. Right? He had a great left-hand knockout power. Man, this guy uh, was a, just a beast in fighting. And, and he started fighting and training in the uh, late 90s, and he fought really hard for a few years before he finally won uh, the belt for his weight class. He became the very first UFC lightweight champion. It's a big deal, right, back in 2001. And as you can imagine, this was, this was everything he had dreamed of. 
I mean, here he is. He is a grown man. He is a world champion. He is on top of the world. And there's someone there who hands them a microphone because they want to get his immediate reaction. They want to hear what he has to say. And he grabs the microphone and, and, and he looks down at it and he gets really emotional and he starts to cry. And then he looks up and he says something to the effect of, see, dad, I did amount to something. Here he was, a grown man, and yet every single day that he stepped in the ring, he put his dad's face on the opponent's body, and every day he went to war with his dad. There was something so dark inside of him that had to be addressed, but obviously it hadn't been. Now, I'm going to share with you something that he wrote in his biography, but I am going to warn you that it's heavy, and if you have a small child sitting with you, you probably don't want them to hear this. Jens wrote a biography, and he tells the story of growing up, and he describes his upbringing as just sheer hell. Talks about his abusive and alcoholic father. And at the start of the book, I reread this chapter today, he, he tells the story of when he is a little boy, and he says his dad was just done with kids. He was done with the world. And he talks about how his dad lined him and his two brothers up in the living room and told them he was going to execute them. And he says, my dad took a shotgun, put it in my mouth, and told me I would pull the trigger, but I don't think you're worth the cost of the bullet. And Jen said this. He said, I will never forget his words. Even in my happiest moments, I, Jen's Pulver, wasn't worth the bullets. That's a lot of darkness. And Jesus speaks in to the darkness, and he says, I am the light of the world. And I read somewhere else that Jens became a follower of Jesus. He's found healing. He's moving forward. But the reason I tell you that story is because I want you to know that when there are unresolved issues in our heart, eventually those issues make their way out. And to all of the fathers celebrating Father's Day, I need you to hear, we've got to deal with any unresolved issues that are in there. They will impact our kids. The unresolved anger issues, the unresolved self-centeredness, the daddy issues we have, the pride, the jealousy, the mental health, whatever it is, it will make its way out. Imagine how different Jen's story could have been if his dad would have let Jesus shine a light in his heart, expose the darkness, he saw the issues, and then he just said, I'm going to deal with them. Imagine if he got to the point where he just acknowledged, I'm broken. I can't fix myself. I need to go get professional help. I need to do whatever I can to begin to cooperate with what Jesus wants to do in my life. Imagine for some of you how your story would have been different growing up if your mom or your dad or your grandparents had addressed the darkness in their own hearts, the lying, the lust, the entitlement, the greed, the selfishness, the cynicism, the, the addiction, whatever it was, if they would have just said, you know what, I sense that Jesus is shining a light on this issue in my life, and I'm going to address it. So what is Jesus trying to illuminate in your heart? What is Jesus trying to show you or reveal to you that you do not want to see? The disciple Peter writes a letter in the first century and he tells his readers, I want you to know God has called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And every time that we embrace the light of Jesus, by embracing the Jesus way, every time that we see who Jesus is, the more clear that Jesus becomes when it's just Jesus, I see the grace, the love, the generosity, the kindness. Every time we see Jesus who, as he is and we embrace it, every time we, we surrender some unresolved issue in our life and say, well, I want to become more like you, every time we make a little bit more space in our life for Jesus, we become more and more filled with his light. And over time, what ends up happening is we reflect that light everywhere we go. This was the plan of Jesus. He said, I'm the light of the world. But in one of his teachings, he looked at his followers and said, I want you to know you also are the light of the world because you're reflecting me everywhere you go. Every time we reflect mercy or grace or kindness or compassion, we're bringing the light of Jesus. So someday, your kids are going to tell a story about you, and talk about the kind of parent you were or are, what kind of story are you going to tell? And I can tell you with, with confidence, my parents carried the light of Jesus. The light of Jesus impacted them, they carried it. 
They never got angry. They were always quick to forgive. Their rules made perfect sense all the time. It was just easy to follow them and love them. No, of course not. Of course not. They weren't perfect. But they did their best. They would take steps forward, and just like all of us, they would take some step backward, and then they would take some more steps forward. This is not a perfect journey. This is not, this is not something we're going to be flawless at. We got to wrestle with it. We're not going to get everything right. But if our heart is open, and we really do want to follow Jesus and eventually reflect him everywhere we go, I'm telling you, it's possible. Deal with the issue. Whatever it is, let Jesus shine a light and just determine, I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you, that light will make a difference. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for being a good dad, a good father, a loving, kind, generous, compassionate father. I pray that as you shine a light on the various issues in our life that we need to just address, that the issues that don't reflect you, that don't show you in a very clear way, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to be able to identify those areas that you're trying to call out and trying to point out to us. And then you give us the courage to take the steps necessary to address that so that we can effectively carry your light everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen.